Let us, instead of talking about the confusing world of coronavirus and the remedies that, are, that we're there with, uh, let's talk about, instead, Brexit, uh, the hokey-cokey of international politics with Lance Foreman, a man we haven't spoken to for a while. Lance, a very good uh, morning to you. Very good morning to you, Mike. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. I mean, I'll take your views on the COVID restrictions a little bit later on, I think, because I'd be interested to know what, what you make of it all. But the, the okey-cokey description of Brexit at the moment seems to be about right, because, you know, last week it was, um, you know, another deadline uh, busted, and then another deadline busted, then a no deal was on the cards. Now it seems to be back off the table, uh, and they're back uh, possibly talking about having more talks. Well, this is typical of any negotiation. Um, in fact, I, I think I tweeted back in March this year that I believe that a deal would probably be done in November. Mm. Um, why would you do a deal earlier than necessary if you can use the remaining time to just, you know, push your argument or defend an argument uh, that might end up getting you a, a better negotiated outcome? So, um, you know, we're in the final throes of these talks. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and I think as far as Boris is concerned, you know, it's not the end of the world if we do walk away and we end up with what he refers to as an Australian type deal. That's absolutely fine. But it would be in both parties' interests, you know, to, to have some kind of deal. But, you know, it's up to the EU now. If they don't want it, fine. If they do, great. Yeah, I mean, I've always said, Lance, and, and I think you would echo this, that business is done um, between businesses and rather than between countries. And there'll be you know, companies already sort of, you know, kind of geared up, if you like, to what's going to happen on January the 1st or the 2nd or the 3rd or the 4th, you know. And it's not as if there's any great necessity for everything to be written down and every I to be dotted and every T to be crossed by December the 31st, is there? Um, absolutely not. I mean, obviously, the more that can be nailed down, the better. But um, I think, you know, in time, we, we will, both parties will work out what's working well and what isn't working so well. And hopefully they'll, they'll work to... Uh, to make it better for both sides. But I think what you're starting to see now is divisions within the EU membership itself. Mm. You see, the EU have a different objective to the members of the EU. And there's no question that uh, Germany, for example, you know, we're their biggest export partner. They want to do a deal with us, but they're being held up by the French fishermen. The Germans don't eat fish. They're not that fussed about fish. So there's there's an internal conflict there, and you know maybe the maybe Merkel will have to I don't know, you know, give a special deal to French fishermen on Mercedes or something. I don't know you know what it's going to take, but um, it could be that there will have to be internal deals with other EU members to you know so they all keep themselves satisfied if they want to get a deal done with the UK. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, because I was listening to some woman from the Confederation of British Industry this morning, some Baroness or other, who was talking about the very complicated series of, of hoops that we're going to have to jump through uh, in order to do deals with the EU. But these are all hoops constructed by the EU, surely. Yeah, well, the EU is in, you see, they're in a catch-22 position, the EU itself. If, if Britain does well out of Brexit... It sort of begs the question, what is the point of the EU? Because other countries that are currently EU members will look at Britain. I know in Italy, they're very divided now. There's a, there's a strong, very strong uh, uh, leave, uh, sort of growing uh, leave desire now. And I think if they see us doing well outside the EU, they'll think, well, you know what, let's leave ourselves. On the other hand, the EU, you know, obviously they, 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 they need us or that they need to show their own values. So they could try punishing us as, as you know, as a result of uh, leaving, but then they'll end up punishing EU members too, and that's not going to work. So I think the EU themselves are in a very difficult sort of balancing act, uh, but I think it will all come good because at the end of the day, it's what the it's what the members want, and Germany is the key member, and Germany wants a deal. Yeah. And meanwhile, this morning in the front page of the Daily Mail, uh, we see the bishops have started to get involved. I mean, I was wondering uh, if we should maybe ask the Dalai Lama what he thinks, and possibly even the chief rabbi. Well, uh, interesting you say that actually, and, and I I've deliberately picked out a quote here um, because the chief rabbi was asked actually. The former chief rabbi, Lord Sachs, was interviewed um, by Emily Maitlis on Newsnight. Oh yeah in May last year, and she asked him whether democracy trumps everything. She was talking about the, you know, the referendum and whether democracy trumps everything. And she said, you know, that you know, even if um, Brexit is economically or socially damaging, which obviously you and I don't believe it would be, um, 
you know, should Brexit still proceed? Sachs responded and he said, and I'm going to quote him precisely, he said, democracy is one of the most profound political ideas ever because it says every one of us counts, every one of us has a voice. You lose that, you lose everything because it then becomes a game for the rich and powerful, which is great for them and bad for the poor and powerless. And then Maitlis went on and she said, so is delivering democracy, even if it results in national economic damage, imperative? And again, he, he, I finish with this, he says, I believe that being a parent means trusting your children, even if you're sure they're getting it wrong. Believing in politics means believing in democracy, even if you're sure the electorate is getting it wrong. You have to empower the electorate. That is what democratic faith is about. You know, he was a believer in democracy, and that's what's fundamental here. You know, when I stood as a Brexit Party MEP um, in May of uh, you know, 2019, there were so many people, even on the Remain side, that said that they would vote for the Brexit Party because that is more important. Democracy is more important than which way the vote actually went. Uh, and I, you know, I think that's, you know, that's what these church leaders should be focusing on right now. Well, exactly right. And I mean, you couldn't find a less democratic place in the House of Lords, really. So for them to be mouthing off uh, about why they think Brexit is so damaging, you know, quite frankly, if it was down to me, I'd, they'd be the first people I would cull from the House of Lords. You know, because why on earth, just because you happen to be an official uh, of the Church of England, which was invented by Henry VIII because he wanted to marry another woman, you know, why on earth are they in there? Well, look, I, I, have, I have absolutely no problem in them passing their views and so on. But I, I do think it's uh, it's it's sad that you know once we've had you know the, the largest democratic mandate we keep saying it you know ever why people just can't fall into line after yeah. that. But, um, well, yeah, I mean it's all very well for them to have their view, but they are in a position to be an impediment to the progress of the bill, which means that actually they're far more dangerous than anyone else who's got a view uh, that they've got who happens to not be in the House of Lords. Well, for, fortunately now we have a prime minister that is absolutely determined to get this thing through and. Um, and I think I actually think the population are on his side. I think that um, you know when he said to the EU that we've had enough now, um, we're just moving forward. I, I think that there was a, a huge amount of support for Boris. Mm. I suspect, and I, I don't think this has been mentioned terribly much, but I, I just wonder whether the EU are holding off to see what happens with the American elections because you know if Biden were to win, I don't think he will. But if he were to win maybe they think that uh, our position would be weakened mm. in some way and, you know, we'd uh, scramble to do a last-minute deal with them because of fears of a US trade deal falling apart. Perhaps, no. I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, no, I wouldn't be surprised if they're certainly stalling for that very purpose. Just finally, Lance, let me get your thoughts on what's going on uh, elsewhere around the country with the COVID-19 restrictions, Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 1, you know, I mean, it's all, it's all over the place, really, isn't it? Uh, well, well, interestingly, you know, what, one of the arguments for uh, this internal market bill was that we should be able to treat every part of the UK in exactly the same way. Mm. And here we have COVID and we're treating literally each part of the UK in a totally different way. It is absolutely crazy. You know, if we were going to have three tiers, what we should do is we should have tier one, the over, let's say, over 80s, tier two, the under 80s that are you know vulnerable in some way, and tier three, the under 80s that aren't vulnerable, um, and, and you know that that's really how this thing should be dealt with. You know, we should um, you know we should rely on the common sense of, of the public. You know, mm. we don't just just think. You know, you don't have barriers on every edge of every pavement. You know, adjacent to the road in case people run into the road. And, you know, run themselves over. People aren't stupid. Right. People do understand the risks now. And, you know, people that are vulnerable will naturally want to socially distance because they understand the risks. And I think trying to legislate for every last little detail, you know, it is just it's, it's just crazy. You know, if you if you want to if you if you want to get this sort of um, thing through, you have to carry the population with you. And when the population either don't understand or think the rules are bonkers, which they are. Um, it's just going to be an impossible task. We, you know, we have to treat people as grown up, explain to them what the risks are and just let them get on with it. Yeah, I think I couldn't agree more. Lance, great to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Lance Foreman, former MEP, businessman, of course, as well. A man who knows a thing or two uh, about selling fish as well. Uh, apparently the Germans don't eat fish. Who knew that? Uh, I wasn't so sure about that. Maybe it's because they haven't got much of a coastline.